I want to second uh, those thanks. Thanks to everyone for coming such a, a long way, um, especially those of you who live in Los Angeles, because getting across the city takes about three hours. And we have jet lag, actually, between the, the neighborhoods. Um, but I also wanted to um, just say that this um, conference was kick-started by a, a grant from Linda and Harlan Martins and from my own Martins Economic Forum, but it was really given strength and body by the Leventhal School of Accounting here and by Dean Holder. Um, there was just no way it could have happened. Even We couldn't even have imagined it without the help, um, not just of staff, but also of him helping me uh, imagine this conference. So I'm really very grateful. Also, um, it turns out that some historians have also um, helped fund this. The Early Modern uh, uh, Institute has helped fund this. The Dornsife College of Arts and Letters uh, as well. And so I just wanted to sort of point out the fact that this conference has been initially, was initially envisioned in a historical context. And one of the reasons for that um, is that, um, hold on, are these slides? And one of the reasons for that is I did a long-term research project in which I went into all the archives of specific governments who were trying to actually build up their states. Um, those governments included uh, Medici Florence, the Spanish Empire, Holland during the Golden Age, Louis XIV. Um, I went through actually many German archives, uh, British archives, and one of the things that struck me throughout my trip through history, also actually early America, was when people were nation building, there were not only accountants at the fore, everyone from Jean-Baptiste Colbert to Benjamin Franklin were all trained accountants, they thought about nation building in terms of accounting. They knew they needed central ledgers because they had studied republicanism, classical republicanism, from the Middle Ages in, uh, uh, in Italy, in which from the 1300s onward, city-states actually had central ledgers from which they used to, which they used to actually manage their, their, their cities, their trade, uh, uh, and all their internal regulations. This was a goal that was known by people like um, Philip II of Spain, Louis XIV, and numerous other major politicians. So at the moment when states were being built um, by figures like this, accounting was at the fore. Accounting um, legislation was at the fore. Philip II wrote some of the most sophisticated accounting legislation about how to make a central ledger to manage the Spanish Empire, but he failed. And so one of the things that I found doing my history was not only accounting at the fore, and I'm talking double entry, often proto-accrual accounting, with the idea of a central ledger and balance sheet, which the king or the ruler would actually have to learn to audit. This, by the way, happens in Holland, um, where Prince Morris, um, sorry, this is moving a little slowly, Prince Morris actually has a double entry ledger and is able to audit it. He learned accounting. There were books that actually said in Golden Age Holland, everyone in the society would need to understand basic accounting, especially the prince, because the prince will have to do the final audit. And I was very, very struck by this fact because I saw massive amounts of data over time in history, and this is in Europe in particular, that showed me not only the importance of accounting, but a deep awareness of double entry accounting and what I call proto-accrual accounting, a very clear sense of accounting over time and the fact that it would have to be, there would have to be a managerial <coughs> central ledger. Um, now, I also saw enormous amounts of failure, except in places like Holland, um, where they invent um, modern capitalism, uh, the first publicly traded companies, there is trust. One of the reasons for that is, as I've said at numerous other conferences, there was a huge culture of accounting and accountability in Golden Age Holland. But one of the things that struck me the most for this conference that has to do with actual debt was studying the role of accounting in the South Sea bubble in 1720 um, and the Mississippi bubble in France, the two great first bubbles. And one of the things that is really and there have been books about this, but Britain actually came up with the first bailout for the South Sea crisis. And I think many of you know that both France and Britain had about 50 million pounds of debt, which was an enormous amount, um, after the War of Spanish Succession. 
Um, both countries could not find a way to pay that debt, so they found private companies that would take the debt off their hands and service it for monopolies in their colonial projects. Both of those projects turned out to be Ponzi schemes, essentially. Both of those projects failed in 1720, leading to um, economic chaos. But France and Britain were in two very different situations. The British were financially literate. That's a long story. It has to do with Francis Bacon. It has to do with the University of Cambridge. It has to do with certain strains of Protestantism and the role of accounting in society. People were extremely literate in accounting across society, but also within their leadership. As the South Sea bubble stocks were being floated, Archibald Hutchinson, who's considered the inventor of financial analysis, held up in Parliament a basically accounting sheet in which he said that the shares of the South Sea bubble were worth nothing, um, were worth a, a tenth of what they were supposed to be. People ignored him, but suddenly within Parliament, there were accounts being shown on the Parliament floor, and within society, the press started publishing accounts. Um, he then published work such as this, and this became, by the way, the beginning of the financial press. Accounts in society. People discussed them. They talked about them. They flew around. Um, when things went south, or they collapsed, um, luckily, Robert Walpole, who was known for being a crook, but also was completely financially literate, started coming into his own as the first prime minister. He was able to create a bailout for the South Sea Company, more or less by using a sinking fund and understanding how money would work over time to bail the South Sea Company out and try to give the stockholders at least 50% on, on each pound they had invested. Um, he also used the sinking fund as a secret political slush fund. However, France did none of this. No one, I have all the internal memos, accounting was recommended, um, uh, uh, a new form of government management and debt management was recommended, it was all thrown away. Huge stacks of internal memos over that. The, the British started bringing accounting and accountability technically into government, but real accounting tools, and they kind of fought their way out. Walpole was utterly corrupt, but he saved the South Sea bubble. He managed to pay off of the 46 million of debt that was left, about 12 million, while, or 18, while stealing another 12. But as he said, he still paid off a big chunk of that debt. And Britain went forward with um, a remarkable um, new political culture in which accounting was at the fore. And by the end of the 18th century, debt comes back and they create another sinking fund and the British are now talking about government, governmental virtue, and government debt in, in not only in terms of accounting numbers, but actually using accounting tools. The French do not. Um, we know what happens there. What you don't know is that during the French Revolution, the French Revolution was enormously about accounting. They create accounting tools, offices, they train people, and they consider this, my friends, in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, accounting is considered, accountability via accounting is considered a human right, um, which many have forgotten. It's in the American Constitution, uh, um, uh, Article 1, Section 9. Accounting becomes part of political discourse. The mechanisms are that you have the press, you have people in government talking about accounting, holding up accounting sheets, balance sheets, discussing them in public. What I wanted to say that strikes me and the reason that I moved to organize this conference and you know, make several months of my life disappear and others and force people across the Atlantic to come talk about this was I don't see this happening in the European debt discussions at all. I don't know where the major accounting leaders are when people sit down to talk about Greek debt, other debt across Europe and these financial things. We don't use it as a mechanism of speaking about how to manage debt um, and, and political financial crises, and yet up until the after-war period, it was very, very typical to have accounting leaders there doing, for example, in this country, some of the biggest reforms after the Great Depression and the war were actually accounting reforms. Therefore, according to those of us who study political theory, accounting needs to enter the political language again. That basically means people have to start taking accounting seriously and bringing it into um, politics. Not this way, though. 
not with the Maastricht definition. That is a political definition that does not reflect financial reality. We know that there are there are various ways of looking at money, but there is gravity with money. You eventually come down. So the current situation in Europe to me seems extremely dire from a political, the standpoint of a political historian, a historian of political language. I don't know where the accountants are in the major part of the debate. I don't know where the debates are about the accounts, about the standards, and about the role that accounting plays. What I have found through years and years and years of archival research is that if you do not have accounting as part of these languages and as central tools, you will have financial crisis. This also, by the way, goes for the private sector too, banking uh, companies as well. So this is the reason I was inspired to do this, because I see our moment as unprecedented and actually uh, breaking away from a long European tradition, which I believe help build modern government. Some might argue with me that that might be a bad thing. I think it was actually a good thing because I live in the 17th and 18th centuries and we were working very hard back then to build governments because we didn't have them before. Thank you very much.